Okay, I'll have to preface with uh, five of our winter days that we have in Florida. We only have about five a year. Three of them are why I'm out here. It was 38 degrees in Florida when I got up yesterday morning. So glad to come out to the warmth. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of statistics for you. I know it's probably a little depressing after lunch. You'd like to see a lot of graphs and stuff. Um, and not a whole lot of pictures. What I'd like to do, though, is kind of take this topic and tell you up front that we could spend a whole day actually showing what each component is and how to actually implement this. Our orientation for our residents and fellows is actually three hours on just the bundle implementation and what they can expect when they come in the ICU. So what we're actually going to do is talk about how to implement the ABCDE bundle and also talk about reducing your ventilator days and as Dr. Wilson talked about, we're going to do a little bit on delirium screening and kind of talk about it as an overall process. So no, no disclosures to reveal. Objective-wise, how many of you have actually heard of or actually have a form of the ABCDE bundle in your institutions? Is it done consistently? Any challenges? Okay. If you said no, I was going to say I need to know what your secrets are. So when we look at it, what is the ABCDE bundle? When you look at it, it talks about, of course, awakening, spontaneous, it talks about awakening trials, screening for delirium, early mobility, which she briefly talked about, but the choice and use and duration of sedatives, analgesics, and medications for delirium, all of that goes into like a protocol. We're going to talk about how to develop the protocol, what some of our challenges were and still are in certain areas. Um, we have multiple ICUs and some ICUs do a little better with the ABCD bundle than others. And then we're going to talk about the strategies that you can use maybe at your institution. So what is it? It represents an evidence-based guide for clinicians to approach when looking at taking care of the critically ill patient. Uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine uh, has done a couple of papers on it. Vanderbilt did a lot of work behind the bundle itself. Uh, and it goes back into looking at how can we reduce VAP, how can we re reduce ventilator days. She mentioned in the previous lecture that delirium increases the patient's not only hospital stay, it can increase their ICU length of stay and have long-term cognitive effects. So if we can do stuff up front screening for this and early intervention, maybe we can help reduce that. Uh, the delirium portion is very important to me. When I did my doctorate, my actual doctoral research was on implementing a sleep program in the ICU and comparing whether or not that had a reduction in delirium, ICU length of stay, and overall hospital length of stay. Well, I guess that we did a really good job designing the study because we suddenly had this major increase in people screening positive for delirium. What we found was the people were not screening appropriately before. But overall, after implementation of a sleep program in a med surge cardiothoracic ICU, we had a 4% reduction in ICU length of stay. And this was over a 90-day period. So it's just things that you want to look at. With this, we want to assess, prevent, manage pain, spontaneous awakening trials, spontaneous breathing trials, choice of analgesia and sedation, assess and treat delirium, and early mobility and exercise. That's kind of the overall. So. Why do we want to do it? I can tell you when we first started in our med surge cardiothoracic vascular ICU five years ago, multiple complaints. Um, you know, I know any ICU nurses in here? You know how y'all are generally really passive and just kind of, you know, <laughs> go with the flow. Um, we have that one person in our ICU, and the remainder of the staff initially, it was right off the bat, this is going to be more work for us. I don't know why the physicians, the providers, you always want to do more work for us. Nobody wants to look how to reduce it, everybody wants to add. So we had to kind of start with, all right, let's look at why we're doing it. What are you currently doing that's not going to really change, just maybe enhance? So we really made it back to focusing on the patient. Um, I know it's only in my ICU in, in Florida, but a significant number of our greater than 10 year, 10 year nurses think a happy ICU patient is negative four, sedated, tied down, and unable to use a call light. Um, it's kind of a rule of thumb if you really start, call light more than once an hour for four consecutive hours, you've got to be confused and need Presidex. So I know it's only at my place, but if you think about it, they're moving, okay, it's okay to move, the newer nurses, they're moving, I, I, I know, it's okay. We're going to talk about reduction in complications to include ventilator-associated pneumonia and uh, 
the infections that you can get in your deep tissue injuries. All of these things tie into early mobility, getting them up, getting them moving, having them move around and not lie still. We're gonna talk about things to reduce the ICU cost. Initially the thoughts were, okay, is this gonna cost us more money? Any hospital. Uh, and then, no, it actually doesn't. It can save you money if it's done right. So it's important for us to take a look at it. And we initially, as I said, started in a 20 bed med surge cardiothoracic vascular ICU. The trauma ICU is an eight bed ICU. It started in the med surge about five years ago and started in the trauma ICU about two years ago, I guess. Um, and so we're still working through some, some struggles there because we have very different structures as far as provider coverage days and nights. So what was one of our number one issues? It was staff buy-in. Not only the bedside nurse, but from leadership. Uh, the medical director, the, the lead nurse practitioner, um, we all kind of bought into it. The director, if he was talking to the providers, he bought into it. If he was talking to the nurse, he felt their pain. So we immediately, immediately had a disconnect we had to work with. Without the buy-in, and you think about, if it's gonna be effective, it's multidisciplinary. So who all has to be involved? Pharmacy, OTPT, case management, pastoral care if those needs are there. In our institution, in the med surge, cardiothoracic, the rapid response nurses participate in the rounds as well. And in the trauma ICU, it's the TNLs. But the nursing side of it, not only the bedside nurse, but the people who are helping coordinate the care. So to get everybody on board, to say every morning at 11 o'clock in the med surge cardiothoracic unit, we're starting in bed one and we're gonna do rounds. And it was a while to get the process going. Well, we found out very soon that we had a whole half of a day where after rounds, not a lot got done. So then we started looking at doing the PM rounds. So now in all of the units, there's also an AM and a PM. PM, we don't have all the fluff. We don't have OTPT, don't have the PharmD, but we do have respiratory. We have the, case, uh, the uh, hospital case manager that's on for the night. If there's any issues, we'll say, hey, we need to talk about placement, blah, 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 could you please come? Other than that, we have the bedside nurse, nursing leadership that's on at night shift, and we were able to continue the process. So after we got staff buy-in and everybody was like, well, at least think about it, but can we still make them sleepy from 7 p.m. to like noon, you know, some little time period? And we implemented this one, let me get my politically correct. We implemented this great new program a couple of years ago for family-centered care, where in the ICU you can stay all down, uh, all night. <laughs> and as the complaints got bigger, because we happened to wake the family members up, we're, we're kind of now only one person. Before that, unlimited people could stay. Yeah. So when you got a room and you got two people in there and you got, you know, it, yeah. So once we started doing these processes uh, and starting including the family in rounds, um, trauma actually started that before any of the rest of us. They included the family members in nighttime rounds. So that kind of helped get a little bit more of the staff buy-in, saying, okay, they understand the expectation. They're not going to be fussing when I wake them up at 2 a.m. Then we looked at developing the bundles of care. That was a challenge. Uh, once again, I know my institution is probably isolated, but to get six trauma surgeons to agree on anything, <laughs> then go and get six pulmonary critical care people to agree. So uh, what we ended up, instead of trying to do consensus of six and six, we had representatives from neuro neurosurge, neurology, and the specialties, one from each, and they had to come out of the room with an agreed upon bundle. Uh, and that's actually worked out for us, but we tr initially tried to get everybody's buy-in to make everybody happy and uh, surprise, that didn't work. Then we had to talk about how we were gonna do the educational piece. Where do you think the educational piece should start with? It actually had to start with us as the providers. Um, we had someone from another department come and watch each one of us do rounds, and what she ended up doing was compiling a list of just how different each one of us conducted rounds. Like to me, a big thing, because I always get fussed about it, is getting lines out, getting Foley's out. So it's like, how long do they have the Foley? Do they need it? Can they get a pyruvate? Do, a condom cap? Or can we get it out? And she's like, and then Eve, who's my counterpart on, I'm a nocturnist, so this is a weird time of the day for me. Uh, the other half, hers was always about, what, where are we at on the two? How, many, are they, how long were they on pressure support? And she said, each one of y'all focus is different. We've got to have a collaborative focus 
on the points we're going to hit, and each one gets emphasis. You can't only worry about the lines and the tubes, and she can't only worry about how long they were on pressure support. We got to do this more con uh, as, a, as a conglomerate of this is what we're going to focus on. So what we did is we developed a rounding sheet that's actually laminated. So the nurses fill in their part, RAS and the CAM and stuff we'll talk about in a minute, when the lines were placed, when their diet, last bowel movement, all this stuff is on, they bring it out of the thing and the provider, we give the first little blurb, this is Mr. So-and-so, he came in, motor vehicle crash, operative course, you know, whatever, and where we're at, we're on hospital day five. And then the nurse picks up, each, color, each section is color coded. Nurses knows theirs, respiratory knows theirs, OTPT. So everybody participates in rounds. And at the end, the residents have to summarize what the plan is for the rest of the day. Because they get there at 5 a.m., they should have already had that. But developing the tool actually made it really easy for us. So what we want to do when we're looking at the tools is have a consistent tool that everybody uses. And if you get the buy-in to, to develop it, it works out pretty well. And we want to make sure that we do really good focus on the ICU triad. With that, we want to look at sedation, analgesia, and then delirium assessment and management. How many people, as just a rule of thumb, put everybody on propofol in the ICU? That was something that we've seen, we're seeing a lot of. And we have luckily shifted away from that. The 24 hours after admission, regardless if you're post-surgery or trauma, we start looking at getting off the narcotics. Um, used to, that was a problem. You know, think about how long people stay on fentanyl and then you try to do good awakening and breathing trials and they've been on fentanyl for four days. Uh, we're using a lot more Presidex. We're using consistent assessment for RAS. In our order set now, we have to put what RAS score we want to be targeted and it automatically comes out. Before that, you could just leave it alone and you know, propofol fentanyl and move on. Now in our hard stop order sets, you have to actually address that. The same when you're doing your rounds with the CAMS uh, ICU scoring. You know, if they're at risk for delirium, and one of the struggles we had in the beginning was delirium versus, again, my, only my institution, we have alcoholics in the ICU. Uh, so you could almost count on day three, you know, we're maybe screening for delirium, well, that ain't exactly it, it's a Budweiser deficiency. Um, once again, only my place. So what we try to do, part of our initial approach to that was everybody was getting a benzo as part of the CWA protocol. We started moving away from that. As she mentioned earlier, you really don't want to use a lot of benzos. So we started looking at if we, you know, wife says he drinks four mixed drinks a day. Well, that's probably eight. I mean, let's be real. So if we get that in history up front, then we start looking on day two of actually implementing maybe Presidex or something to kind of head off what's going to happen with the with the uh, alcohol withdrawal. When you're looking at your sedation selection, think about what you're giving it for. Um, I still have a cardiothoracic surgeon that thinks that, you know, if, if they just had their chest open, that's not really that painful, that, okay? We'll just put them on propofol and then we'll just add a little bit of Toradol later this afternoon. I'm like, seriously? And you expect me to extubate him and have him in a chair at 5 a.m. with Toradol? He goes, oh, yeah, it's not that bad. It's, it looks a lot worse than it is. I'm like, have you ever had open-heart surgery? Well, no, but I've had friends. I'm like, well, it really looks bad. <laughs> he goes, eh, they'll do fine. And he flat does not, Tordal, that's where we start at Tordal and intermittent Q6 Oxy-10. That's what you get once the probe falls off. And I got to say, his patients do well. Now, they complain. We have a, a little adage at our place. We finally figured it out. We couldn't figure out why. If you walk through the new unit, there's a distinct separation of staff. It's probably the best way. Start on the mid-surge side, which is 12 beds, and you got varying ages, early 20s to 50s, age-wise, day and night. Then when you round and go down the corridor for the CV ICU, the oldest is probably... 33, 35 maybe, 40 tops. They're all thin, attractive, and it suddenly hit us. A fat old woman ain't gonna get you out of bed 10 hours after open heart surgery. A 28 year old might. So we finally figured out that's why they're hiring all the young nurses, because if she goes in there with her southern twang and said, Mr. Smith, you know you gotta get up out of that bed. Come on, honey. They get up. 
Me, on the other hand, if I go and say, listen, bud, I know this sucks. Today is going to be really bad, but you got to get up. They don't, they don't respond like that to me. <laughs> so it's an age thing. But if I was having open heart surgery, I think I probably could understand it. We'll see. Ventilator mode. A lot of discussion in our institution on when to go to pressure support. We had a, little, a lot of pushback on the trauma side initially, um, especially within the first 24 hours. They just weren't really big fans of it. So we had to kind of work with them. And our institution, as soon as you can go to pressure support, we get you at a negative two. A lot of times you'll tolerate pressure support. Even if it's 30 minutes, an hour, or two hours, we, within 12 hours of intubating you, will start trying to get you to pressure support, spontaneous modality. What we found is that they keep coughing, they're using the respiratory muscles, and we have a lot less problems with the VAP if we can get them there. The other thing when we was looking at ventilator modes that you have to decide at your organization is what is an acceptable reintubation rate? And we had no less than a six month back and forth before anybody would finally come to a consensus. In the med surge ICU, we have about a 14% reintubation rate. Some people at our organization said, well, that means you're not extubating enough people. 25% is acceptable. If you're extubating 25% that require reintubation, you're aggressive with weaning and extubation. Another thing to think about when you're developing your protocol, what is acceptable? And then look at doing a sleep protocol when you can. Uh, it seems like everybody thinks when you come to the ICU that you get ambient and you should be able to sleep all night. Uh, not where I work, maybe some of the other places. But one of the things they do in our trauma ICU, which has been very effective, from 9 p.m. on, the lights are down, it's 7 a.m., lights are up. They really try to distinguish day and night, and that seems to really work well for them, and we've tried to do more of that in the med surge ICU. The cardiothoracic, everybody's up at 5 o'clock. That's just what they do. So how do we get it to do what we want it to do and get it effectively implemented? Part of that is going to be getting provider commitment and meaning consistently. How many times have you gotten there day three? We do 15 shifts a month, and they may be – Five in a row, six in a row, seven in a row, three in a row. It just depends on what we got going on. So I can tell you when you get there, and it's like day five, and, you know, it's the same group that you've had. They're sick, and you got two CRT, and you get there, and you go, I really don't want to spend two hours doing rounds. You got to do it. You got to do it consistently every day. And, I'll, you know, be honest, once I get started, I'm okay. It's just that getting the computer and getting to room one to start. But you've got to have the provider commitment to do it every day. You've got to have the administrative commitment that they buy into this process. They value it as important. What I found at my organization is when you start tying it to money, they tend to listen. Um, and so, therefore, there's always enough staff during the daytime to do rounds, including OT and PT, uh, which initially was a little bit of a struggle. If they, were, if they were working with patients, they were in the unit. If they weren't, they, they were not in the unit. So to get them committed to coming and doing rounds. And then you got to have a consistent hardwired process. It's like now when we go in uh, and do shift, you know, shift report, we get out, oh, we're still on for rounds at 10 p.m.? Yep, we're still on for rounds at 10 p.m. The staff already have their sheets filled out. They have their list, as I call them, their, their wants. Uh, I always tell them, I'd rather you not come to me every 15 minutes. We're doing rounds. Give me your list. They have a list. This is what I need done. Dot, 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 dot. The foley needs to come out. The central line's been in for six days. Are we going to get picked? What are we going to do? And it just seems to work better for the patient. Um, even our new cardiothoracic guy, um, we had not up until recently done axillary placements of impellas. We'd only done femoral. We're doing axillary now, and he's getting them up and walking them around the CVICU. We've had two so far. Both did well. But they were both less risky than some of the folks that end up with impellas. Uh, let's say they weren't as high risk as some of the other ones. They were bridging to surgery. But the uh, first time you brought one back and saw about getting them up, you should have saw the uproar. You're going to do what with them? But if you think back, when you first started thinking about walking patients on ventilators, do you think people are crazy? You're going to walk them on a ventilator? Well, how are they going to do that? They should be asleep, right? But we've come a long way, and this is the next evolution in that mobility and trying to maximize everything we can to make them as healthy as we can once they're out of the ICU. You're, we talked about your MDR rounding tool and your consistent uh, assessment tools. If you have an EMR, is the tools in there what you're using? Is, uh, ours is not built in. Um, not what we use is, but other options are not. So if you're thinking about using the Richmond agitation, the RAS scoring, make sure that that's built in, that everybody understands how to use it. 
uh, make sure that if you're doing the CAMS ICU, everybody understands exactly how to administer it. What we found when we did our education was that was the problem. They would be positive and you'd go in there and go, they're not, they're a little eccentric maybe, but I wouldn't say they're delirious. Uh, or they're cantankerous and they're not answering, that don't mean they're actually delirious. So we did a lot of education with it. And establish your rounding time and procedure. Who's going to start it? Who's going to play what role? What time of the day? And the thing to think about is this should be seven days a week. Um, we had some struggles in the beginning with weekends because we had less staffing on the weekends with OT, PT, and those kind of issues. Um, so getting it consistently on the weekends was a little bit of a challenge. And how are you going to measure it? You're going to look at measuring your ventilator days. What are they when you start it? What are they in the end in your total ICU days? If we can get them up and moving off the ventilator earlier, transition them out of the ICU, we actually can save money and decrease the ICU length of stay, which looks really good on metrics when you're, when you're looking long term and comparing. And what are your complications? I can tell you we have less complications doing this process than we did before. Uh, we have a lot less self-extubations, which, you know, people get really bent out of shape and you have to report. Uh, lines getting pulled, these kind of things, having these people more cognizant and aware, we have a lot less problems with things getting pulled that shouldn't be pulled. In conclusion, what you want to do with an ABCDE bundle, your whole goal is to make the patient care better. Reduce the amount of time they need to be in the ICU. Get them off the ventilators early. Get them up and moving, even if it's doing the passive range of motion until they can do better than that. But what we want to do is reduce any time that's going to contribute to the critical illness, polymyopathy uh, that she was talking about, complications, ICU psychosis slash delirium. Any of those things increase the patient's uh, length to stay in the hospital and actually can have long-term residual effects. So reduce ventilator days, reduce ICU length to stay, <clears throat> reduce complications, and questions will be answered in a little bit. If you won't have any questions or want copies of our rounding tool, it's went through 17 evolutions, to be honest, to get where it's at now that's consistently filled out. Uh, but I'll be glad to give it to you. Um, other than that, thank you.